We all have kids. You know how hard it is sometimes to start a conversation with them. That's the icebreaker. It's a lot easier to have a conversation if you're shoulder to shoulder looking this way mm -hmm. as opposed to you peering into my soul <laughs> and asking me <laughs> what my deepest thoughts are. You know, that, that's an uncomfortable conversation for a lot of people. <laughs> You know, our kids were kind of born into that, into the gaming world. Absolutely. Of, co of course, I had a Atari 2600 because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we all did because I was playing Frogger. <laughs> right. And so you had like an Activision or something. No, it was Atari. Oh, Atari. Mm -hmm. Okay. When the kids were born, they had a PS1 and it just went on and on. Dreamcast, the whole nine. Yeah. And you were talking about how... The rules we set with the kids. We had to set rules yeah. because we found out that they were, in our opinion, leaning so hard towards prioritizing video game play that they were just rushing through the prerequisites of the house the school or chores yeah just to get to the gaming yeah and how do we change it and that became a problem when you said that i flashed back to a conversation i was having with uh, our friend Dwayne and uh maurice mm -hmm. shout out to the black futures podcast they were talking about surgeons and they were saying that there's no way in the world i would have a surgeon who wasn't also a gamer <laughs> Wow. And he said that because like the way that modern surgery is done in many cases in microsurgery, it requires the dexterity of being somewhere virtually that you're not physically. Okay. Meaning like I'm controlling the remote uh -huh. of the micro cam and micro laser thing. I don't have my hands in that person's chest. Uh -huh. And so gaming is a, is a prerequisite, a prerequisite for uh -huh. these guys. Or like, I don't even want you cutting me if you're not, <laughs> if you're not one of these guys. That made me think, well... I think we made the right decision for ourselves in the moment of limiting the boys' gaming. But absolutely, there's also a curriculum to be discussed for parents who understand that the future does involve some of the tools that are fleshed out through gaming. So what I've done is I invited our very good friend, Dwayne Meekins, to the show. Dwayne! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Let's do it right. Yeah, I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> D, across many levels, you are an entrepreneur, uh, especially when it comes to video game related things. You got the Salty Suite, which is a uh, game arena mm -hmm. based in Charlotte, North Carolina. You got the game truck. Uh, welcome to uh, Advisory Mode, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. We know what we did. Our stuff is all past tense now. But for parents coming up today, you know, obviously video games is a force of nature. What do you think is the uh, correct approach to balance the priorities at home and academically with exposure to video games and how are you handling that in your own home well it's basically past tense for us as well yeah but we didn't allow the boys to play until uh they they were not allowed to play video games during this the work the school week so because we didn't want them rushing through homework or chores as, as you mentioned earlier uh to get to the gameplay yep. so it was like you can't play today so just take your time and do your homework and, yep. and be good at that mm -hmm. and once you establish that baseline it's not hard for them to understand it moving forward we maintain that until i want to say maxwell was in 10th grade like they couldn't play in during the week mm -hmm. and then looking forward i said well once they leave the house i don't want to keep that rule in place and then they go to college and they are able to manage all of their time. And it's like, well, I never could play during the week before. So I'm going to get it all in now. Yep. And they end up failing out of school. So because yeah. they're my, unable to manage my, that freedom now. Mm -hmm. B, I think in a conversation we had previously, you do something similar. I basically gave Maxwell uh, a couple trial years before I said, hey, look, uh, 11th and 12th grade, I'm going to be a little more hands off and yep. you're going to manage your time, your schedule, the things that you need to do, you need to manage. And that includes gameplay. So I stopped waking them up in the morning to go to school. I stopped managing all of that stuff for them. And I said, mm -hmm. if you want to play, you can play, but we're going to have problems if I see a decrease in your grades and then you're going to have to come see me. Yeah. You've been over our house before, and one of the games that we played is Overcooked. What's the cooking, What's the game, cooking called? game 
Overcooked. 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 Yeah. You told me that you use that game in team building activities. And so there's another <laughs> like facet to the value of exposing kids to games and using the, the, game, the, the game as a tool to build real world activities and exercise and traits. Talk mm -hmm. about that for a second. I do use Overcooked for team building activities. It's a, a great game. You have to communicate with your teammates while you are playing that game. Otherwise, you will not be successful. Kids learn through playing. Uh, whether you're playing in the sandbox or playing video games, kids learn, uh, and I use gameplay as an overarching term there. That's how kids learn. And if you allow them to do that, kids figure things out. They figure out how to communicate, who's a good leader, who's good at this thing, what kind of skill does this take? Um, there's also been studies that show that kids who play video games are actually better at real world problem solving. A video game will force you to uh, look at a problem in many different ways whereas in the real world people who don't play games well that was a challenge for me i'm gonna back up a little bit further and run a little bit faster to try to get through this brick wall mm -hmm. whereas a kid who plays a game will say well i might try that two or three times but after that i gotta go around it i have to go under it i have mm -hmm. to go over it or i have to find a tool to help me drill through it but they'll explore all of those options because the game mechanic does not allow for this thing to happen whereas in the real world people who don't have that kind of experience will continue to try oftentimes try to do the same thing over and over unsuccessfully as you were mentioning earlier the reason that uh mo and i are proponents of having a surgeon who is also a gamer is for microsurgery the, the non-invasive procedures, they're basically playing a video game. It's operation in your body. They're you, don't want the, you don't want the red nose to glow? <clears throat> no, I don't, I don't want any red nose glowing <laughs> if you're operating on me. And <laughs> when I was in the Coast Guard, uh, a buddy of mine was one of the first drone pilots that we had. And we were in the cafeteria one day and I asked him how work was going. He said, man, my job is great. I sit at my desk and play video games all day. <laughs> He's flying, he's flying, he's playing a uh, flight simulator, like literally playing flight simulator, but he's actually flying a plane. Right. You know, it's, it's not a video game. It's a, it's a real thing. Right. So those skills actually do translate. It's not a waste of time. Mm -hmm. So what should parents be thinking? How would you change your strategy in today's <laughs> environment? I like the strategy that we employed. I don't know that I would change a whole lot about it no gameplay during the week until 10th grade is, is probably a good option just yeah. until they get beyond the, the candy and the instant gratification mode. Once, you know, once they're in high school, they kind of understand delayed gratification a little bit more. And you as a parent kind of have to be that, that block uh, for the instant gratification until they get to the point where they understand that themselves inherently. My kids, I believe, are well adjusted and uh, they still play games as hobbies, but they they handle their business. They have friends, they go to work. So I don't have problems with them neglecting their actual responsibilities because of gameplay. Yeah. I, they don't neglect their responsibilities anyway. I don't, didn't mean to insinuate that they did in other ways. So I don't I don't know that I would change a lot. One of the things that I liked and I didn't have to employ um, Xbox, especially the Xbox 360. I, they had a tool where you could actually set gameplay hours for your kids. It would allow you to set it for an hour a day, two hours a day. You could set it weekly so that they would manage their time. So if you wanted them to be able to play maybe two hours a day, you could set it for 14 hours a week. And mm -hmm. if they went through their 14 hours in two days, then that was on them mm -hmm. because it didn't reset till the following week. Different so I really like that. You um, know, I find that kids, when they're younger, you have to manage like, you know, you can play on the weekends, but not during the week. But I find that as they get older, it changes because our kids would start staying up all night to play. So like, you know, Mike would be going to sleep at six o'clock in the morning because he's literally been up all night playing. So while the younger ages, you're concerned about them getting their homework done and their chores done, in the older ages, you let off. So, you know, hey, I'm gonna let you budget your own time. At the same time, 
there is this, at least for us uh, and Mike in particular, there was, he's uh, now getting up late or um, extremely tired going to school because he's been up all night playing. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I think that's where his, his time management wasn't great. It's all going to hurt when it's come time to start paying the mortgage. Yeah, I totally agree with that. <laughs> or, or studying for tests. And foggy brain doesn't remember things as well. No, it does not. We, we've seen that <laughs> way too many times. Uh, jumping topics for a second. Yeah. D, you are also a retired Coast Guard officer. So you know a little something about building teams and all that. You also, uh, I know, have a project dealing with using gaming as a medium for engaging with college students or people interested in the military and with veterans. Do you talk about that a little bit? Or did I just totally um, jumble the whole project? So am I mixing two projects up? Just straighten me all the way out. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, it's kind of two different projects. I like to use gaming as a way to engage people. Uh, and it has different applications depending on the, the group that you're working with. So a lot of vets actually use it to address and as a way to cope with the PTSD that they uh, may be suffering from or hmm. service-related depression or depression in general. I also like to help uh, use gaming as a way to intervene for uh, youth and, and let them know other options that they have as far as career opportunities, especially for uh, our disadvantaged youth. And I'm actually going to work with a local police department next Tuesday. So it's just, hey, there are other things that you can be doing as opposed to running the streets and, and doing things that kind of decrease the options that you have for your future. So let's, let's keep all the options on the table until at such point we remove those options ourselves. Let's not have those options removed for us mm -hmm. by, yeah. by poor decision making. And so it's to actually help them expand the options that they have and are aware of. How do you go from having people on the consumption side of the sticks to the production side of the sticks? Have you thought about how you're bridging that conversation? That's actually what I do with, uh, with those kids. Depending on the study you read and the day you read it, somewhere between 80 to 86 percent of black youth between the ages of 12 and, and 19 played a video game within the past week. We over-index on, on the consumption part of gaming. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the backside of the industry as the people who are involved in production, we're right at, we have around 2%. So wow. we way under index there. And what I like to do is kind of bridge the gap between those two and let people know, hey, uh, none of this stuff just fell out of the sky. You know, somebody put this stuff together that you mm -hmm. enjoy doing. You have ideas, you have thoughts, you can, you have a voice. Why don't you use that? to create something that you want to do and that mm -hmm. you want to see. You, you alluded to it earlier. We've been playing games since the Atari 2600. And until very recently, all of the characters of color, because the industry is overwhelmingly white, mm -hmm. all of the characters of color, whether they be black or Asian or female, the, the black guys are rappers, basketball players, mm -hmm. or retired boxers. All the Asian guys are samurais or ninjas. Yeah. And all of the women are teenage boys' fever dreams. Mm -hmm. yeah. And those aren't accurate representations of any of those groups of people. Mm -hmm. And the way you actually get accurate representation is to have people who look like those people in the room when you're creating the game. Yeah. I know a couple of black guys that act like what you stereotypically see in a video game. Right. But most of the black guys I know are not like that. Mm -hmm. Like I'm talking 95% of the black guys I know are not like that. Why is that all I see when I see somebody who happens to look like me in a video mm -hmm. game? Right. Yeah, I agree. So How do the representation see... piece of that matters. True indeed. You ask what parents in 2021 should do. I will say play with your kids. You should, if mm. you, if you have kids who play video games, sit down and play with them and you don't have to be good at it but you're spending time with them doing something that they enjoy we all have kids you know how hard it is sometimes to start a conversation with them mm. and that's the icebreaker it's a lot easier to have a conversation if you're shoulder to shoulder looking this way 
mm -hmm. as opposed to you peering into my soul <laughs> and asking me <laughs> what my deepest thoughts are. You know, that, that's an uncomfortable conversation for a lot of people. I uh, think that's great in, advice. Kids included. So you should have led with that, with man. Hey, yeah. <laughs> I you should have led with that. that. That's that's the gym right there. <laughs> Y'all know how hard it is to get a conversation started with Mason, my youngest. When we play, he'll start talking and we're talking about the game. Mm -hmm. But after that, I can talk to him about anything. Hmm. But that's the that's the end. Yeah. Yeah. You just got to come take that whipping first and then you can talk to him. <laughs> you got to pay the toll, dad, because you know you're going to take that L. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's the reverse dad tanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, man. It's been fantastic. We love having you on. Let's do it again. Y'all have a great day. Thank All you. Right. You too. Bye.